for those of you who don't know me, I am Lisbeth Borg Divart, and I am from Norway. Uh, well, my father is Dutch, that's why I have the Dutch surname. I understand a lot of Dutch, uh, but I don't speak Dutch. I do, however, speak some English. <laughs> I am uh, I am born in Oslo, the capital, but I've been moving around in different countries and different places in Norway. And now I live in the north of Norway, in the far north of Norway, um, which in Norwegian terms really isn't that far. It's like midway uh, up to the North Cape, actually. Um, but it's about 22 hours drive to Oslo. Okay, so tonight I want to talk about how we can make dog training a bit easier and certainly a lot more nicer for our dogs. So we're going to talk about how we can make life just more easier, I think, easier and uh, a little bit less stressful. I think we have enough stress in our lives already. Uh, I also think that we are sometimes complicating dog training and behavior for that, for that matter, um, more than necessary. So that's why I think back to basics is a nice topic. It's a nice name for this uh, PowerPoint and what I'm going to share with you tonight. So, so back to basics. This is not far from where I live. And this is, um, well, um, is it still my dog? Um, not really. It's, um, it was used to be my dog, but now he lives with my ex-husband. It's a rough collie, as you can see. His name is Huntley. And um, it just, yeah, it's nice, isn't it? It gives you, uh, I hope it gives you a feeling about what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to talk about how and why dog training does not have to be very complicated. And now I'm talking to people who has family dogs. That's what Nordic dog trainer is about. We don't do, we, we do know about dogs and behavior, but uh, our, um, uh, what you call it? We are mostly dealing with family dogs. Um, and how a few simple body moves can help you out if you have a reactive dog. I'm going to talk about two things that some of you already know very well, and that's curving and hand signal and how knowing the common signals will make you and your dog's life much easier and more enjoyable. And I'm not going to talk about the common signals in this PowerPoint, uh, in this webinar. Um, there are 50 plus um, recorded webinars already on our Facebook page. So if you go and click videos on our Facebook page, then you'll see previous webinars I've had. And a few of them are about calming signals. Uh, also on our web page, we do have some free resources uh, for you from me and from Turi de Rugos, my Norwegian colleague and friend, the author of the book on talking terms with dogs. So first of all, when we take an animal into our home, like a different species, species than we are, I think we are obliged to know something about um, that animal. So what do they need? What, what are their basic needs? What are their instincts? And how do they talk? Um, I think a lot of uh, people would um, hesitate to have people living in their house that you didn't have a common language, uh, a language in common, uh, like exchange students or something. I mean, it's, it's great fun. I've been teaching uh, Norwegian to foreigners living in Norway and some of them did not speak English. So it's great fun, but it makes everything a lot more complicated. 
So we already have a lot of trouble communicating between humans and even humans speaking our own native language. So imagine uh, how complicated we are making it by not learning the dog's language. Okay, so there's been many studies um, about dogs' behavior. And recently, and when I say recently, I mean the last 10, 20 years, um, there's been a lot of studying going on. A lot more than ever before, actually. And one of these studies are of free-ranging dogs in India, free-ranging, meaning dogs that do not have an owner. So it could be street dogs uh, living in a big city or they could be living out on the countryside, whatever. They don't have um, an owner, human owner. So they did a study, they studied the street dogs. This uh, study is from 2014. So it's already getting a bit uh, older now. If you want to find uh, studies and scientific care papers, you can go to Google uh, Scholar, Google Scholar, and you type anything, dog studies, dog, free ranging dogs, whatever. And you will find a lot of studies there on Google Scholar. <clears throat> So with every study, there is always something, isn't it? So this study, they studied the dogs mostly during the day, morning, day, afternoon and evening, but not entirely 24 hours a day. So be aware of that. They did not study them 24 hours. So some of this is, uh, I mean, it, it's a whole, everything put together and with the knowledge that dogs are sleeping 60% of their sleep during night, we can assume that this, the, um, at night time, when they did not observe the dogs, they mostly rested and slept, mostly. But yeah, so this is just for your information. So 50% <clears throat> of the time they were inactive, meaning they were not doing anything special. They were not running, playing or anything. They were just being inactive, sleeping and resting, and so on. 27% of the time, they were alone. So either alone being inactive or alone walking or being active. 4% of the time, there were vocalization. So they were either barking or some kind of sounds when they were um, uh, playing or guarding, or whatever it was. Aggression, zero. Did not observe any aggression. Eating, chewing, and toileting was 5% of the time. And bonding was 10%. Bonding meaning um, sleeping or resting together, laying next to each other, licking each other's ears, you know, whatever they, they do when they're together to bond. Did you, by the way, know that dogs, for dogs, it's very important to be social and to bond and have a good relationship with whoever uh, are around them, which means that when we come home after work and your dog is happy, for your dog, it's very important to show that he or she is very happy for a very long time. The longer the greeting is going on, the more the dog is bonding with you. So that's, that's actually a very natural and important behavior for dogs. <clears throat> so a typical day for these free-ranging dogs was sleep and rest for about 14 hours. Uh, scavenging, because that's what they do, the free-ranging dogs. They go around eating a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot what we don't like that they want to eat. I'm going to talk about that a little later as well. They spend a lot of time, two hours, uh, scavenging. 
uh, chewing and, well, of course, going to the toilet. Chewing is very important as well. And it's a, it's a physical uh, good thing to do, um, <laughs> moving the jaws and everything. And for the teeth, it's good for the teeth, of course. And it's also a stress reducing activity. And they like to chew a lot of different stuff. Actually, another study showed that there were, um, and this was done in Africa. So there were a lot of different bones and, and stuff that from animals that we don't have in Europe. Uh, but they, it was more than 40 different textures and shapes, tastes, tastes and everything. So chewing is not just getting a bone. This is your bone. Chewing is important and it's important that they can cho uh, choose different textures and so on. Four hours in total, it was movement and mostly walking, mostly walking. Two hours socializing with the group, so just being around, hanging around, <laughs> um, play an activity. Not all dogs play, uh, grown-up dogs, adult dogs, but of course the puppies and the adolescent dogs, they do play. Uh, and that activity was around one hour and taking care of the group and itself, so guarding, protecting and so on, also about an hour. And a day in our world could be looking like this. Uh, we get up at seven. We have half an hour walk with, uh, with our dog. The dog gets some food, takes one to two minutes to, to eat. Um, and then it's home alone for nine hours, maybe even in a crate. Uh, the owner comes home, maybe go for, for um, cycling or jogging so as I, I see that it's uh, I, I forgot to um, correct that mistake not job but jog jogging for one hour and then the food uh, the dog gets food again dinner for for a couple of minutes maybe sometimes the owner goes out again to do some activities on his own uh, or to do shopping or something and the dog is home alone again for two hours maybe again in a crate and I'm saying maybe because a lot of dogs here in Norway and other countries that I know about, and I know their dog owners, they are spending their time in the crate. So this is, um, this is true. A lot of dogs do spend so much time in a crate. Uh, also, um, yeah, and then the dog owner comes home and watches some TV and the dog is there maybe next to him. And then out in the garden for, for a few minutes before bedtime. Maybe then even in a crate again. Okay. So why do we need to know this? Because is this uh, uh, fitting well and nicely together with the needs of the dog, the natural needs? the natural needs and instincts. I don't know. Because they do have a lot of interesting, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> natural instincts. Some of them are very interesting as well. Um, <clears throat> and the fact is that we cannot make these instincts disappear. <clears throat> In fact, sorry. <clears throat> In fact, we have been breeding dogs for many years to have those instincts. What we can do is we can train and make these instincts either uh, stronger or weaker. So for example, hunting instincts or guarding instincts. So basic natural instincts, they are also a survival instinct. So it's not something, again, don't believe you can ever get rid of an instinct. You can't train it away. You can make it stronger or weaker. 
And many times problem behavior is because we, without knowing it, trained the dog so that the instincts became stronger. For example, guarding instincts or hunting instincts. So socializing is an instinct. Hunting is an instinct. Hunting meaning running or moving after everything that is moving. Objects like cars and people. Kids that are running around playing. And guarding, to guard yourself, to guard and defend yourself, definitely it's an instinct for all of us. <clears throat> and, and dogs are actually kind of born to run, to chase things, especially puppies and younger dogs, adolescent dogs, uh, because they haven't learned anything yet. Uh, they haven't learned to control themselves. They, have, they need a lot of self-control to not let their instinct just, you know, um, yeah. So when you have a puppy, especially a puppy, and that puppy is um, in the living room together with kids that are running around playing, it's very, very difficult for that puppy to relax, even in a crate. Um, and again, uh, we have bred these breeds, these dogs that we live together with today. And um, it's very, um, it's various how strong the instinct is depending on the breed, of course. And that is also one of the problems today is I think that a lot of people are choosing the wrong breed. That we are looking too much at how the dog looks like instead of choosing the right breed for you. I love Borsois, you know, the Russian greyhounds. Uh, I love them, but I could never have one. It's not me. I, it's too many instincts, hunting instincts for me. Uh, so that's why I have a Basset instead. <laughs> a Basset is more like me. A Golden Retriever is more like me. And I have an Italian Greyhound, which is certainly, it's a Greyhound, but it's really, it's very far from a, a Russian Greyhound, a Borsoi. So uh, I do have a little bit of Greyhound in my house. Yeah. But it's important to choose the right breed. Already there we can, we can uh, eliminate a lot of future problems with the uh, with living together with our dogs so when I say observe it's I say observe a lot of times because it's important that you do observe your dog uh, many times when I have courses for for puppies or for adolescent dogs I'm talking to the owner about the dog and the owner never really looks at the dog the owner looks at me, even though I'm explaining that we should look at the dog and I am not offended if you don't look at me when I'm talking, because I would like you to look and observe your dog. Um, so you need to start watching your dog, looking and observing what is your dog doing. And I mean, not staring, because that's rude, both for humans and dogs, but observing your dog in different situations you will learn so much from it. So you might already know quite a lot. What does your dog react to? What uh, does he or she chases? When does it do it? And for how long does it do it? <clears throat> and then we have the guarding instinct, which, which also can be a lot of trouble when it's kind of out of control. It's a natural and survival instinct to guard, to take care of yourself and your puppies and your family, whoever uh, is close to you or in your group, and to, of course, defend yourself. And the dogs are then usually then using distance increasing signals when they're guarding. So distance increasing signals, that is growling, lifting the lips, uh, barking sometimes and trying to look really scary to scare whatever 
is threatening them away. So when we do know these things, um, then we can get a lot of help uh, and advantages when we're training our dogs. So have a look at your dog. Uh, what does your go dog guard, if anything? Maybe your dog doesn't guard very much. What and when does it bark? And what, and maybe even when, does it try to defend something? And does your dog get scared or anxious? And in what situations? Because they're using the same body language. They're using the distance increasing signals when they are scared. And this is very sad because that's the most misunderstood um, behavior is that when they're showing the distance increasing signals, which is also called aggressive signals. It is to scare away something that you feel uh, is a threat to you. And no one can decide how you feel. So that's why you can't tell your dog to stop doing that behavior if nothing is changing in the environment. So if, if the thing that is scaring your dog is not going away or something, or you are increasing the distance, it doesn't help telling anyone that is scared of something to stop behaving like that because we're doing it because we are scared and it's an instinct. Also, we are using over, the, the instincts are being overused or misused too much. Um, when dogs are living in the wild, when they don't have an owner, then they don't go hunting yeah, hunting. <laughs> um, they rest to be able to hunt for food. They used to do. Now they're scavenging yeah, around us. They eat our food or our leftovers. Um, but the hunting instincts are, is used every day as well. They still have the instincts in a small degree or, or a large degree, depending on the breed. So, for example, running a back and forth behind a fence in your garden to chase whoever is passing by your garden is the hunting instinct. If your dog is also guarding the garden, he's, he's using two of his very basic and very important instincts, hunting and guarding. And that's a great reward for your dog to be using those instincts because he thinks he's doing something very important. So that's why he's not listening to you when you're standing there, maybe using a body language that is also mm, threatening to him. And you're standing there trying to do a recall with a little treat in your hand. It doesn't always help, very rarely. Also standing in the window barking uh, or guarding, if your dog is guarding when he's doing that, uh, or very commonly, unfortunately, is to guard their food or their bone, whatever they need to eat. So the basic, do basic needs are food and water, of course, and they're scavengers. So in the, in the wild, without us there, they don't get their food presented on a plate or in a bowl. They eat a lot of things we don't want them to eat. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you should let your dog eat whatever he wants to eat. But I'm just telling you that this is an instinct. And actually, dogs, they do like to eat shit, to be honest, from animals, especially from cats. And unfortunately, from humans. So a lot of dogs, they do like it, but you don't have to let them do it. You need to train your dog. We don't like that, of course. But maybe not giving all of the food in a bowl and letting your dog use its natural instincts to go around scavenging a little bit in a controlled environment would be good for your dog. Of course, 
always fresh water. And I can't believe I have to say this, but I actually, I remember I met a dog owner whose breeder had told her that the dog was not supposed to get any water during nighttime or before bedtime. And, because, um, and also the dog was putting on weight drinking water, the breeder told them. So I have to say this apparently, always water 24 seven, of course. And like I just said, they need to chew a lot. And they've done um, uh, studies or they've given bones to dogs in shelters where they get just a little bone. So they chew for about 15 to 20 minutes a day. But that 15 to 20 minutes a day of chewing for all the dogs in the, in the kennel, in the shelter, was doing a great difference to the stress level. It was reducing the stress level uh, quite significant, significantly. So chewing is very important. Of course, going to the toilet is vital. A lot of dogs don't get to go to the toilet when they want to or when they need to. Um, and a dog that are uh, in a crate is really trying to hold himself because they don't want to go to the toilet where they're sleeping. So it's even worse to be in a crate. And that's something you have to take into consideration when, for how long you're leaving your dog at home. In Sweden, our neighboring country, they actually have a law, very strict law. Uh, first of all, in Sweden, crates are forbidden unless they're used in a car during transportation or at the vet's office. But they also have another law saying that you're not allowed to leave your dog home alone, unattended for more than six hours. You have to have someone coming to take your dog out if it's going to be home alone more than six hours. And it's, it doesn't have possi any possibilities to leave the house himself and go out to go to the toilet. So that's how strict the rules are. And that's not something they're just making up. Um, they actually had to buy or make bigger police cars in Sweden to uh, accommodate the new laws for the, the size crates and, and so on. Animal, we should look to Sweden when it comes to animal wel welfare, I have to say. Okay, safety is another instinct for all of us, isn't it? So. We need to feel safe. And dogs are a social animal, so they feel safety when they are, are interacting with um, us, humans, or other dogs, or even cats, other animals. We know that. Um, that they like, of course, that they feel comfortable with and that they trust. Then they feel safety being around those other uh, beings. And it's very important to feel safe, to be able to have a good night's sleep, to have good quality sleep. No one can have good quality sleep if you don't feel safe. And when it comes to sleep, dogs are very much like us. Um, even to the extent that if they don't get enough sleep, they get they can get the same illnesses that we have. It's, it gets physical. Uh, first we get grumpy and then it's different to concentrate and it's a lot of things happening if you don't sleep very well, isn't it? So the same things are happening with dogs. They've done a lot of research on this already. So good quality sleep is so important when it comes to uh, having a good, um, what can I say? To having fulfilled all the needs to the dog and to avoid any problem behavior. Dogs are social sleepers, meaning that they would like to, they prefer to sleep wherever their family is, whether it's humans, cats, or other dogs. So they like sleeping in near them, some closer than others. Yeah, they like to sleep on different surfaces, 
hard surfaces, soft surfaces, <laughs> surfaces, warm, cold, they need to choose. They, they are wandering around, sleeping in different places. That's their natural behavior. 60% of their sleep is typically during night and 40% during the day. And they also like, they prefer to sleep uh, on something that is a little bit elevated from the floor. So even dog beds that are just a little bit elevated from the floor, the studies show that the dogs would prefer those uh, to those that were directly on the floor. But again, this is very individual, yeah? So what I'm getting, is, uh, getting at is how important it is for a dog not to be in a crate when it's sleeping because it has needs. It go, moves around, gets up, maybe eat something, uh, chew maybe, uh, and drink something and go and sleep somewhere else. And again, it's very individual, yeah. So dogs, just like all of us should have freedom to express and to do natural behavior, but we have to train them to fit into our way of living. And, you know, I don't like my dogs eating shit either. So of course they're not allowed to do that. I'm trying to avoid that the best I can actually. <laughs> and a lot of these natural behaviors, they feel like a problem behavior to us. And they do really become a, a, a real problem as well. If you have a beautiful garden and you love your roses, of course it's a problem that your dog is digging. Chewing, it's a problem when I, our dogs are chewing our furnitures, isn't it? Or your shoe or your very expensive iPhone. Peeing and marking, it's a natural behavior, has nothing to do with dominance. Um, barking, yes, it's very natural. And they should be allowed to bark now and then. But then again, we have to uh, train and help our dogs to understand and to be trained so that they can fit into our way of living. So when someone is passing by the street behind me and my dogs are outside and they bark, I actually let them bark if it's just a couple of times, just to, to well, they could be barking to the other dog passing by, or they could be just warning someone about it. That's fine, but they cannot be outside in the garden late at night, past midnight and bark uh, on something because my neighbors are sleeping. So then I don't allow them to do it. So positive dog training is not about letting your dogs do everything they like to, whenever they like to, just to make that clear. Also, Sniffing is a very, very natural behavior and they need to, to sniff because four, they have a, uh, in their 40%, so 40 times bigger uh, part of their brain, um, they are using to, um, to uh, process the information of smells. And we know that this ability to smell is a million times better than ours. The more, well, not the most, but I've said that many times now already, haven't I? But one very important thing about smelling is also to let your dog finish smelling, not just start smelling. And then you, you ask your dog to stop smelling, to continue walking. Uh, they've done studies on this as well, <laughs> that it's very important for the dog's well-being, stress levels and all that to be able to finish smelling once they started smelling something. It's not natural for dogs to walk straight, straight in a straight line when they're going for walks. It is very natural to walk all over the place. So we have to teach them how they can stay close to us when we are passing others on our walk. But during the walk, if there's no one around, and if it's, 
you know, if you're walking in a place where there's no cars, obviously, um, then you should let your dog walk in a long, on a long leash and cross uh, the road, the, the pavement or whatever you're walking on. If it's possible, of course, I'm just telling you now what's natural and normal and what is not. And again, scavenging. So eating whatever they find. Also keep in mind that puppies and young dogs, they, they are curious. I mean, hopefully your dog is a curious dog throughout his life, but especially puppies and dogs, uh, adolescent dogs, they need to learn about their environment and they don't have hands. So they take things in their mouth to try out. Is this tasting good? Is this something I can chew? Is it something I can eat? <clears throat> so if you are walking your dog in an area where there are things you don't want your dog to eat, then you have to find another place to walk your dog. So freedom of choice. Here is a few examples of how we can give our dogs a little bit more choices. A little bit more. Sleep and rest where and when they want to. An ad, uh, adult dog needs between, uh, it says different things on, on different uh, studies, but between 12 and 14 or 14 hours, 16 hours, depending on the age of the dog a day, rest and sleep. A eight year old, uh, eight week old puppy that you get home when it's eight weeks old needs between um, 18 to 20 hours sleep. That's a lot, 20 hours still. And a young dog, nine months old, needs as much as up to 16 hours sleep a day. Sleep and rest. Also, we should give the dogs a choice of who they want to greet. So if you meet people that don't know you, or all people actually, they, they should get a choice of, um, of uh, not being touched if they don't want to by a person or another dog, or certainly lifted up. To choose to be touched or petted, to choose whom to play with. Just like us dogs, have good relations with some, they, they have good friends, best friends, and they have other dogs that they don't really care for very much, um, but they're like us, let them choose. And some people get very disappointed, and I understand that if your parents has a dog and your dog does, get, does not get along with your parents' dog, uh, we can help them to get used to each other, but we can never force them to be friends. They can choose the length of the walk, especially puppies should not be walked, by the way, for, for a long walk. Um, you should not walk your puppy on leash before it's three months old, three months. And then you can start training a little bit about walking on leash for a few minutes at the time. Um, but uh, senior dogs or adult dogs or even young dogs in pain they may be sitting down they don't want to walk anymore and we think why don't you want to walk and then we don't know the common signals and we don't know you know so we just ask the dog or force the dog to keep on walking the, the dogs can choose where to walk uh, more than they do today and that's just very easy. If you have one dog, if you have two dogs or several dogs, then you have to have one dog choosing each day. But if you have one dog and you, uh, the road uh, is, a, um, the road is uh, what do you call it? Uh, dividing into two. If your dog wants to go to the left, you want to go to the right for no reason at all. Why do you still insist on going to the right? So, it's things that you can actually do, small things every day. Of course, also choose to go to the toilet. So whenever your dog really is showing you or telling you he has to go out, take him outside. And when and where and for how long to sniff. 
And this is, and I can't say that um, uh, enough times, really, one of the biggest differences in stressed dogs is when they are allowed to start walking on a long leash and sniff, and sniff as long as they want to. The dog is getting less stressed, a lot less stressed in many instances. So already there, you can do a lot of changes if you have a dog that is showing problem behavior. Choices gives coping ability. So what do I mean? The more choices we give a dog, the more, the better the dog will be to uh, do problem solving by itself. Dogs are perfectly able to make good decisions for themselves, but we have to let them. So uh, dogs are also curious animals. That's how they become uh, our best friends. They were curious. So they started following us humans and living around us, eating waste and so on from humans. And then um, they're now the number one animal. I mean, how many other animals do we really have next to us in bed? And the same interaction with us as a dog. So from the puppy is uh, born, let him be curious all his life. It's very important to be curious. It's a sign of a healthy dog, healthy dog. Um, so the more you can actually explore and um, problem solve yourself, the better your confidence will be. It's the same thing with humans. If you're not allowed to do anything, we have less experience of doing things and being out, being socialized with other people and so on. And we have a big problem already now. I, I, listen, I heard on the radio um, uh, the other day about how young people, um, especially after the corona, um, it was very young actually, it was the, uh, the kindergarten kids, uh, how, what a difference it had made to these uh, kids that had to stay home during corona and couldn't start kindergarten. They weren't used to interacting with other kids. So it's the same thing with dogs. They need that. And socialization in groups is very important for dogs. It's also, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an instinct. Uh, and it gives them safety, a feeling of safety, uh, parental care, of course, finding food together and finding a mating partner together. Makes sense, doesn't it? So dogs are definitely so, uh, social animals. What is um, interesting, and of course also very sad, but very good that we're starting to learn about now is something they call social pain. <clears throat> when a dog is not having the right socialization uh, or even being isolated, it has um, been proven that that has, is the most common cause for stress for, for social mammals, including dogs. So if a dog is isolated, that is one of the most common causes for a high level of stress. And in nature, animals also use social isolation as punishment. Yeah. Studies show that social pain exists and that physio, um, psychological pain has the strongest effect on stress response, meaning that um, social pain has a higher effect on the stress response of the body than uh, physical pain. And I think you can relate to that. We all felt that the pain of losing someone or whatever it is, but uh, psychological pain, breakups, 
<laughs> yeah, divorces or uh, some near close to you dies, that is, that is painful. It's a real pain and dogs feel the same. And causes for this pain can be for dogs as well, isolation. So uh, here in Norway, we have a lot of hunting dogs. They're standing outside all year in small cages, crates, not very big ones even. And they're standing next to each other with a meter between or something. They're not even together all year. They don't come inside the house. Uh, so being excluded, being uh, rejected, involuntary separation from a partner or a friend or a sorrow and sorrow and grief associated with the death of a friend. So dogs, they can feel pain, social pain, and their level of stress can um, uh, be very high. For example, if it lives in a family and it's a divorce, or if the kids are moving out of the house, the dog can miss the kids and feel that social pain. Um, the good feelings of being social is of course well-being and the feeling of safety and security and isolation is the opposite. It's, it's unpleasant and in worst case, even painful. Um, being lonely, feeling lonely, and not feeling safe, and even being scared. So remember that dogs are very social animals, and one of the most important effects on domestication has been the strong connections to us. And studies show that our family dogs might, this is very interesting, have as much need for socialization with humans as with other dogs. We're never going to finish studying uh, dogs or, or anything else, I hope. Uh, but this uh, is very interesting, I think. Some are even claiming that they think, a uh, study shows that they think maybe that some dogs can even uh, be satisfied, uh, even yeah, satisfied with having a human, uh, only hu uh, contact with humans, not with dogs. But still most uh, studies shows that as with humans, we are very happy when we meet someone like us. So the dogs also need to meet other dogs that they like and that they can be good friends with. It doesn't have to be a bunch of dogs. It doesn't have to be many dogs. Don't go to a dog park and and let your dog off leash with a whole bunch of dogs you don't know. But if you have a dog park that you can sign up, that you have a, the dog park for yourself and you can take one or two other friends. It doesn't have to be more than one friend. It's nice if your dog has a couple of friends, but one is, is more than none. <laughs> or it's certainly more than 10 dogs that he doesn't really want to be with. Uh, studies also show that dogs might be the only species that is able to form social bonds with two different species. Uh, but that's, well, yeah, I have a lot to say about that because I think they can, like we can form social bond with, with other species as well. But to take away from this is the importance of um, socialization of the dogs and it needs to be with us humans and it needs to be with other dogs as well as much as possible actually so how social is your dog and how much does your dog socialize with other dogs other humans and you yourself and again it's very individual of course some dogs does not have the same need as a Italian Greyhound, I've had four of them and they're all very, very uh, happy to be cl very close to you. Uh, whereas uh, other breeds or other individuals, uh, they don't need that closeness all the time. So uh, it's very individual. Okay, mental and physical health. 
an exercise. We have to find the balance. I'm just going to talk quite briefly about this because it's very individual, but it has to be a balance. All of these things that we talked about, the physical um, and the mental needs of the dog compared to what the natural behavior was in free ranging dogs. To be happy, to feel good, you need a good balance of all this. Good nutrition, good physical and good mental exercise, socialization, good socialization. You have to be around people and dogs that make you feel good. And like I said as well, let your dog sniff <laughs> and let it finish sniffing. It is more important to let your, it. what was I supposed to say now? It is very important to let your, your dog finish sniffing in one place. And that's up to us. We can easily let our dog sniff longer. It's you. I'm sorry to say, I'm not, I don't know, I know. And I didn't know this before. I'm not born with this knowledge. This is something I learned as well along the road. And I uh, think about when I, what I did before I knew this. Not good. I don't want to think about it. But now I know better, luckily, um, for the dogs I have now. So let them sniff. It's more important that you're out and about for 30 minutes than how long you are actually walking for, how, for the distance you're walking. And again, please don't go around saying that I'm against dogs moving because they need to move. They need to, uh, Amelil Kvam, my Norwegian um, colleague, she, she says, it's, it's a lovely thing to say, every dog deserves to be able to run as fast as he can every day, once a day at least. Meaning that if you had a big garden or a fenced area or a safe area to, uh, that your dog could at least once a day run as fast as he or she wants, yeah, or can. Don't force them, don't take them, don't have, a, don't take out your bike and let your dog run next to your bike that's not necessarily what, what your dog wants okay they also like to feel as part of of our family and i think you recognize that in your dog as well it's nothing wrong to teach your dog to do something like taking the clothes out of the clothes out of the washing machine or to help you clean up his toys to put them back in a box or something. Um, this is fine. This is my Wilma. She's, a, she's my office assistant quite often. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I could do with a better one, but she's the cutest one. <laughs> so having your dog go with you when you go and get your mail. I mean, physical mail <laughs> in your mailbox or like my my rough collie that loved to come into the, the barn where I had the chickens. He thought that was one of his tasks every day to certain time a day, twice a day, he came with me and he just sat there making sure that the chickens got fed and they got the water and everything. So that was important to him. So let your dog feel like it's doing something useful as well. So what has all of this got to do with training? I think you're starting to get my point. <laughs> because a lot of these problems we experience is because there is a mismatch between the dog's need, needs, sorry, and his or her everyday life. For example, boredom. This is a, a real life picture from my old house. This was just a pillow that uh, there was a hole in one of the pillows in the, on the couch. And I don't know who started this, but they had a lot of fun when I was out in the kitchen. So to me, that was not problem behavior. That was just my dogs having a good time playing with something because they could play with it. But a lot of us are experiencing um, 
uh, real problem behavior. For example, destroying things when they're home alone because they're afraid to be home alone. Yeah. Or dogs that is doing it because they're too stressed, because they're stressed, they're overwhelmed, overexcited. Or dogs that can be bored, so they're doing it out of boredom. So it's very important to, when we first, when we're going to help a dog to get back on the right track to reduce stress levels and, and uh, for example, a fearful dog would have quite a, a high level of stress because being afraid is giving that um, reaction to the body. You need to know what is normal and what is uh, natural and important and instinctive behavior for the dog so that we can try and match those best together with the nutrition, with the mental exercise, with the physical exercise and so on. So you make to sure, you have to make sure that the, uh, your dog has its basic needs fulfilled, food and water, not just any kind of food, but the food that is good for your dog, right? Uh, food can do a lot of difference as well. And the right amount and the right type of exercise, both physical and mental, and has um, the social needs covered, social needs with other dogs and us, the owner uh, or parent, um, the enough, uh, enough rest and sleep and good quality rest and sleep and that the stress levels is more nor at normal, not excessive use of instincts like running after a ball or yeah, these kind of uh, activities. So in um, my world, training a dog is training the dog to, to develop, to get some good life skills and some good habits and to help my dog um fit into the kind of society that we humans have and that entails interacting with other dogs other animals uh, and humans so we have to help our dogs developing good social skills and basic uh, important skills like recall i think that's very important that could be potentially dangerous if you're dog was running out of your car and out on the street or something. Um, we need to have our dogs on leash um, quite often, I would say, depending on where you live, obviously, but they need to learn to walk on a leash and good habits like not stealing food, um, not begging at the table if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't, if you want to share with your dog, that's fine. Um, but not jumping on people and so on. Um, yeah, so that's training for us. And we can use their natural instincts when we are training dogs in a good way. Because now we know that one of the natural instincts is running or moving after something, something that is already moving, following moving objects or humans. So a dog will follow something that is running unless there is something more exciting. And that's where the training comes in. You have to train this and you have to start when it's a puppy. So that is an instinct. When we are running away from the dog, the dog is more likely to come after us than to run the other way around, unless there is, like I said, something a lot more interesting. But if it's you and, and your dog outside on a field and you are walking in uh, one direction, your dog will follow you. Walking on leash, the best way of starting that kind of training is starting to train a dog without the leash. Because what we are um, going to teach the dog is to not pull the leash and to, in order not to do that, it has to be in a certain 
um, area around us, certain, uh, yeah, can't remember what it's called, either language at the moment, but let's say you have a three meter lead, <laughs> then you have to teach your dog to be able to be around you three meters each way, back, forth, sideways. And then when you train your dog to follow you in a certain proximity to your body, to where you are, then you can put on the lead. Because the lead is there for an extra safety, isn't it? So uh, yeah, and then good habits like preventing the dog from stealing food, jumping up on people and so on. I would suggest uh, what we call the attention sound, uh, which is teaching your dog um, I have this sound. I'm just going to see if they're, yeah. I'm just going to do it once because they're sleeping now. <laughs> that means, hey, uh, a message coming up. I have something important to tell you. <laughs> so it doesn't mean you need to look me into the eyes or anything. It just need, means I want your attention. Then I tell the dog what to do, either by telling, saying something, or by moving. So when I'm crossing the street, I give the attention sound and then I move my body very clearly. And then my dogs see that, oh, we are going to walk in a different direction. We can also use that sound in, in many different uh, circumstances. For example, preventing your dog from jumping onto something or someone um, to stop your dog from doing something. So when my dog is on his way to, um, yeah, what can I say? Yeah, good example. My Italian greyhound is 14 and now he has a bit of dementia. So he can pee inside. So to prevent that, when I see him, uh, about to you know start sniffing and that um, that uh, uh, behavior they have before they're peeing, it's very easy to see. Um, I is I'm giving the attention sound, then he looks in my direction, and then I because he's you know not sure which room he is in at the moment probably, then I will get up from my chair and say come, and then we go outside. It's so much nicer than to always say, no, don't do that. No, 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 no. So much nicer. And dogs are visual, but they're not mind readers. So using our body, being more clear in our body language is doing a lot of, uh, is giving you a lot of advantages when you're training your dog, whatever you're doing, when you whatever you're training your dog to do. Also knowing about the calming signals, knowing that for a dog uh, standing um, right in front of you, looking into your eyes is rude in dog language. Whereas in humans it's the complete opposite. It's very polite. It's unpolite for me not to look at the person talking to me. But in the dog's world, it's uh, rude. And it's even threatening, feels threatening for some dogs. So show your dog where you want to walk. You can show him, you don't have to say anything, try it. Try walking your dog on a long leash. Don't go out on a busy street on a Saturday afternoon, of course. Try this in, on a road or somewhere quiet first. Yeah, Because on the, uh, where there's a lot of people, there's going to be a lot of other things your dog is more interested. So that's why you have to teach him, for example, the attention sound well enough before you start training that amongst a lot of other people. Uh, and yes, remembering what was threatening to a dog to walk straight towards, to walk straight towards and to stand straight towards. So when we're training recall, they are using a lot of calming signals. Very often they're using a lot of calming signals. Um, because we are using a body language that is uncomfortable or very rude to them. So sniffing, not listening to you, 
they hear you, they see you, they know you're there. Walking slow, walking in a curve, all of these things are coming signals. So we can easily have our body a little bit to the side instead of directly to the front. So it's just very small things you can do. Not stare at the dog um, and have your, dog, uh, have your body a little bit to the side. So why does all knowing about calming signals and distance increasing signals, why is that important? There's so many reasons. It's easier to adjust to training situations. Like I just said, if your dog is not coming on recall, maybe it's your body language telling your dog something very different from what you are meaning to tell him. It's easier to see stress in your dog when you know what his calming signals, what his body language is. It's easier to know if your dog is uncomfortable and then you can help him out of the situation before he starts barking to scare away whatever he's scared of. It's easier to see if your dog is in pain, easier to see if your dog needs more sleep, which is again, very important. It's easier to help your dog out in social situations. So much easier, so much easier. You can avoid a lot of trouble with other dogs when you know the common signals, I promise you. It's easier to attend to your dog's needs in general, and your dog will trust you more. Because if your dog is scared or uncomfortable or in pain or in some situation where he needs you, you know, dogs are looking at us, literally looking at us for help. That is a big difference between the wolves and the dogs when they did, can't remember the name of that study, but they have filmed it and everything. Um, wolves, there were two cages, uh, crates, cages, with some good stuff in it, meat uh, or something, probably meat. Um, and it was almost impossible to open. The wolf would never ask anyone for help. And he just, you know, went at it and tried to get the food out. The dog would try a couple of times and look at the owner, help me. <laughs> the dogs are looking at us very often for help. Um, if you have a dog that is comfortable in social situations and with the environment, he does not have need your help, which is good for your dog. That's why it's important that your dog gets to be curious, gets to use his um, problem solving skills. Uh, and yeah. So of course the dog will trust you more when you understand that he wants more distance. If you, uh, if you are passing another, if your dog is reactive towards other dogs when you're going for walks, and instead of increasing the distance to the other dog, you are decreasing, so you're going closer. Your dog won't trust you more because you're doing the wrong thing. So if your dog experiences that he can trust you, the relationship is obviously uh, getting a lot better. And here are two great body moves that you can do, uh, that you can use. And I use them, I think I use them every day. Um, now it's pretty much incorporated in my own language since I live with dogs for, for many years now. Uh, one of them is curving. So instead of going straight towards, go in a little curve uh, or a big curve, depending on your dog, what your dog is comfortable with. And that is something you see when you know the dog's calming signals. So curving is a polite way for dogs to pass each other, humans, objects, whatever it is. It's how they approach us. And they do it to avoid trouble when passing others. I mean, to show the, show the other one that I'm polite. 
And no wonder we get in trouble because already in puppy classes, sometimes we learn that the dogs has to pass each other too close already there at puppy classes. So they start, I mean, when their natural language, natural behavior is to go in a curve and they're forced to go very close and not curving, then you can imagine what happens. The dogs will start using maybe distance increasing signals to protect themselves and so on. So we might already be creating problems by doing that. That should actually be the exam. If you have a dog that is fearful of other dogs, then you should start with a big distance and then the exam uh, would be to, to move closer to the other dog, not start too close. Here's a little, a very short film where someone uh, sent me one of the, our students. Uh, it's an object that the dog is curving when it's running towards the, the object. I'll show it to you again. Now that you know this, you should start observing your own dog in all different situations. When is he or she curving? How big is the curve? And we do it to humans. At some point, we do, we do want to create distance. If you go directly uh, towards another person, you will either stop or you will make a curve. Dogs make a curve always. Small, can be very small, but it can also be very big. Okay. Now, how do I get to the next? There. Next one is hand signal. And Sarah, I was going to use, I asked if she had a great video from our level three course where she showed the hand signal, but my internet was too slow today. So I couldn't, I can't show it. I wanted to show where you had the hand signal. The hand signal we use to stop the dog from doing something. Instead of saying no, 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 or other commands, you can use your hand signal. So if I had a dog next to me here now, and I had some food on the table and I did not want my dog to eat that food, I could use the hand signal. And I could be talking to you or the person across the table and only use the hand signal, not saying anything. And it's incredible. I've seen a lot of videos now from the students because they have it as homework um, and in different situations. And it's extremely effective for puppies, for adolescent dogs, when they're coming running towards you, like running. And then don't say anything. Don't stare at the dog. Look away, look away a little bit. And use the hand signal already from a, a far distance. And it can also calm dogs down. So when they're barking, I can use hand signal. And another example is um, uh, if it's that time of the day that I usually go out for a walk, <laughs> but I'm not going for a walk yet. I have to wait or something. Uh, I would do the hand signal to my golden retriever, who's very fond of going for walks, because when it's four o'clock in the afternoon, she wants to go for a walk. If I then go and pass, or if, or if I get up from the chair already, she, she thinks that I'm, we are going for a walk. So I would get up from my chair and I would actually hold the hand like this. And she would be then in, the, uh, you can't see it here, but in the hallway. So it's another room with an open door, obviously, but it's from a far distance. And when I do that hand signal, she does not get up even because she knows, okay, not yet. This is not something we have to train and tell them what it means. This is something they understand. So you can try it. I'm going to show you a video here now that this is a dog that is fearful of moving cars, cars that are driving, moving. Uh, 
uh, Linda, she is in the purple sweater without the dog. And when the car is coming, she is splitting. So splitting is going between the car and the dog and she's using the hand signal. She's using it, she's showing her the palm of her hands to the dog. That is also a hand signal. This is the first time this dog did not bark on a moving car. And I really wished I had that video from Sarah here as well, because she was sitting uh, on the grass and there was a Labrador puppy coming, running like lab puppies can do. And she used her hand like this and looked away and the puppy sat down. She didn't say anything. The puppy sat down next to her. I'm going to show it to you again. I know it's my internet connection, so it doesn't look like it's going very... I hope you can see the video. So splitting means going in between. And it can be on a long, on a far distance or, or a shorter distance. It is very, very effective. So you should try it. You don't believe it until you try it, until you see it. <laughs> so curving and hand signal. Curving and hand signal. Have a very, very nice evening. Thank you. Bye.